I think that the, our knowledge of the evolution of the brain has got very little to give us at the moment about the evolution of consciousness. We don't understand how consciousness is instantiated in the brain of a contemporary human being and for the same reason we don't know how to trace it back to the brains of our ancestors. What we can of course say is that animals, that the human brain has evolved from animal brains and at some point, at some point in our history our ancestors were performing many of the cognitive and behavioural functions that we, are, we, we, we do all the time, but they were doing it without the presence of phenomenal consciousness. Phenomenal consciousness is an addition. It transforms us from being what I call psychological zombies to fully conscious human beings. And then one can begin to ask, what would, what's missing in someone, for example, who can see but who doesn't experience vision as a conscious event? And on that, we can actually begin to collect evidence. I mean, in, in the past, I, I was one of the earliest people to work on blind sight. I discovered the existence of the phenomenon we now call blind sight in a monkey. She was called Helen. I worked with her for seven years. There's every reason to believe now that this monkey, who developed an astonishing capacity for visually guided behavior, but because she had had an operation which removed the visual cortex at the back of her brain, because of that, she had no consciousness of vision. She, for her, it was not like anything to see. And part of the work I was doing, it took me many years to try to understand from the inside what it would be like to be in that situation. And of course, I didn't articulate it in terms of blindsight, but I remember telling Lawrence Weiskrantz, who went on to do the work with, with humans, that if he did look at humans in the right way, he would discover humans with, with cortical lesions he would, might discover that although they said they were blind, if he could ask them another question, if he could uh, ask them uh, something which got to the underlying um, uh, cognitive and, and behavioural skills rather than asking them what it felt like, then he might discover that in fact they were capable of, of, of seeing in ways which no one had even considered. And uh, as we know history shows, that prediction came out, turned out to be right. We know, blind sight is now um, not only an important clinical phenomenon, but of course it's become uh, an absolute classic phenomenon in, in, in the philosophy of consciousness because it does, it, it, it opens up this gap between cognition and experience, um, between uh, the actual feeling of it's being like something to undertake a task and the mere uh, 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 practical ability to perform the task. Um, so, I mean, even at this meeting, we've many times had occasion to dis discuss blind sight and people take the lesson in different ways. But what I take it to be is firstly that it shows the essential difference between perception, the perceptual skills which we uh, use our eyes and our brain to, to allow us to maneuver, maneuver in the world and to, to recognize objects and to name colors and so on. All that can be present without sensation. And that raises the question then, why do we have sensation? And to some extent, I think even blind sight has begun to answer that. I worked with a young woman in London many years ago who probably had the condition of blind sight. It's not quite certain. She uh, had become blind as a young girl from smallpox. Um, her her, her, her uh, corneas had become opaque. Her vision was restored by restoring her eyes, her, the lenses to her eyes at the age of 22. Um, for all that time she'd had no input, no patent input to the back of her brain and there's every reason to believe that because of that she, the brain had atrophied. Her striate cortex, visual cortex, was no longer functioning. So she was functionally in the same condition as my monkey Helen had been or other patients who've actually had damage to the back of the brain. So the question was what, what, what was her experience? Um, what was it like if, it was, if she was going to be capable, what was it like for her to see? Well, when I first met her a month after the, the operation, she was in despair. She said the operation had been a failure. Uh, she was in, in tears. She wanted to go back home, back to Iran, where, Persia, where she'd come from. Um, but I was given the opportunity to work with her. And because I'd had this experience of working with a blind monkey, I kind of had some ideas about where to go. And so uh, I, I took this young woman by the arm and we walked around London together and looked at the flowers in the park and the pigeons landing in Trafalgar Square. And little by little, I persuaded her that 
she could see, though she thought she was blind, she actually could see. She could step up when she came to a curb, she could point at a flower in the grass, she could reach out and take hold of a handle of a door. But the extraordinary thing was that although she was, she had to agree, she had a skill she didn't have before, she didn't want it. She, this wasn't what seeing was meant to be like for her. She'd spent years imagining how wonderful it would, it would be to see in the way that other people could. She, you know, she'd listened to the poets and heard what everybody says about the, the glories of sens visual sensation. Now, seeing had been restored to her, but it, it seemed to be uh, it, it had nothing of that magic which she was expecting. What's more, she said very importantly, she said, I, I can see, I, I understand I can see, but it has nothing to do with me. It, her seeing had nothing, did nothing to enlarge her sense of self. Now for all of us, uh, it's, it comes from many directions, but of course we, one of the things which uh, sens physical sensations do is to kind of uh, fill our, our, our world with this sense of being present, of being part, of, con of interacting with the world outside us in ways which make us, uh, you know, it gives us a, a, a sense of self which couldn't be contributed by the mere, uh, uh, you know, firings of, of nerve cells uh, passing information around. One of the great consequences of phenomenal sensation is to give, give us a sense of self-worth and from that so much else follows. I mean in my own work I've tried to follow right the way through from raw sensation as it's probably experienced by animals right the way through to the way in which humans build on that to develop a sense of spirituality, of, 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 of being creatures who kind of live outside uh, the, the mere matter, who can transcend, uh, transcend the world in which they live and even possibly survive bodily death. Now, of course, these become very grand ideas which are enlarged and, and, and encouraged by human culture. Nonetheless, I think that this human spirituality which derives from consciousness is actually a biological adaptation. It's proved to be crucial to the success of human beings in living on Earth, and in fact it is the centerpiece of, 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 of all that we now believe to be, what, of what it means to be human. So working from these animal origins and the sensations which arise, I believe, from loops passing backwards between the cortex and the frontal cortex, originally just delivering, you know, colors, smells, uh, sounds and so on, but because these are experiences of which we take ownership, which build up our sense of self, they lead on to a, a sense of human beings as living uh, in, a, in a world of the spirit, which has been uh, transformative. What, what a question, how could I not enjoy the cruise? I'm just sorry I had to wait 70 years to come to such a beautiful place. <laughs>